Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Squanch, Wisecrack's Rick and Morty podcast. My name is Jared, and I'm joined here with the Squanchers. We got Ryan. Wubba Lubba, what the hell is up, everyone? Long time no see. Long time no see. And joining us again is Dr. Nihilism himself, Michael Burns. Hey, glad to be back. <laughs> Hate the nickname. <laughs> <laughs> and joining us for the first time is another fellow YouTuber and podcaster, the renowned Thomas Frank from College Info Geek YouTube channel and the College Info Geek podcast. How's it going, Thomas? Good. How are you guys doing? We're doing Welcome. well. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Excited for this. Yeah, us too. So today we're breaking down Rick and Morty Season 2, Episode 3, Autoerotic Assimilation. As always, let's get some first impressions. Let's start with Ryan. Ryan, what do you think about this episode? I think this is one of the smartest episodes of Rick and Morty. Um, and it has one of the best endings that still gets me. <laughs> like, yeah, uh, that a... kind of comes out of nowhere, but when it does, it's like, wow. Uh you feel something i feel um yeah. but then uh yeah that that's pretty i mean a a plus on this episode mm -hmm. i really i'm excited to talk about it yeah me too what about you michael yeah i mean i agree once again the ending is a gut punch that sticks around even after you've seen it a while but like it just reminded me of the first time i saw this episode when i realized the show was capable of more than i thought in terms of like emotional depth and complexity and i think that that it really like sort of opens up a pathway that keeps the show interesting. Absolutely. Thomas, what about you, man? Yeah, the ending of this episode is depressing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it does stick with you. Um, my overall impressions of, the, of this episode, I think, are a little bit unfairly weighted downward because the previous episode is my absolute favorite one on the show. But yeah. it's still very, very good. The episode with Fart, right? Yeah. Morty okay. Night Run is my favorite episode. Okay. <laughs> It's got yeah. the Garblovians in it. It's got Compropulous Michael. Like, what more do you need? <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. Yeah, I'm, I'm in agreement with uh, most most of you guys. I think this is a top shelf AAA Rick and Morty episode. Mm -hmm. Super smart. Some really funny moments. Pretty dense. It's really rewarding to uh, revisit. And um, I think this is one of the ones I've seen the most. Uh, but even so, it was still enjoyable to watch again last night. So yeah, I love the hell out of this episode. And I kind of feel like maybe correct me if i'm wrong i feel like this is maybe the last triple a perfect rick and morty episode that we haven't covered yet i don't know i'd have to look at the that you haven't covered list. yeah because we've done all of season three all of season one and now we're making our way through season two and we're at season two episode three and like the top ones are me seeks and destroy uh the citadel episode this one i really like the one with the devil mm. and i think we're we're running yeah. low, we're running low on those amazing yeah. amazing ones Trying to figure out what else is in season two. I like. Well, yeah, it. I think you're right. Like the rest of season two. Although my so my girlfriend's favorite episode is Get Shifty. Oh, oh that's in season that. two. There okay, never mind. Yeah. Never yeah. mind. That's I do really like that one. That is another yeah, triple A yeah. one. Okay, so we got some good ones still ahead of us. Okay, awesome. Yeah, Get Shifty is top notch. All How right. did you guys rate season three episode one? Oh, oh, we also love it. amazing. Because that yeah. one's one of my favorites. Super too. impressive. <laughs> yeah, love that one. In general, I am very happy with season three as a whole. Me too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I didn't have a whole lot of complaints with it. All right, guys. So before we go on to the recap, I want to remind everybody that uh, check out WisecrackPlus.com. And the reason why is because today we have two new pilots up for uh, Wisecrack videos that are going to be coming out this week and in about two weeks. But anyway, for our patrons, they are already up and we're taking uh, feedback from our patrons and stuff like that. So if you guys want to join the community, if you want to see the new stuff that we're working on and get it early, check out WisecrackPlus.com. Anyway, on to the recap. So... Rick, Morty, and Summer answer a ship's distress beacon to find it's been taken over by Rick's ex-girlfriend, Unity, a hive mind entity that assimilates people under a single consciousness. Rick and company a com <laughs> Rick and co. accompany Unity to her completely peaceful hive mind planet. Unity tells Rick that she has grown out of her immature party years, but it only takes a little time with Rick before she's back to depravity and debauchery. Meanwhile, Morty enjoys the luxury of thousands of people working in coordination to pamper them, while Summer laments their lack of individuality. Jerry's complaining about Rick freeloading at their house when he and Beth stumble upon an alien prisoner being held in a secret hatch under the garage, bringing their disagreements over Rick to a boiling point. The constant partying and drug use take a toll on Unity and some of the citizens begin to disassimilate from the hive, turning them back to their former selves, i.e. pedophiles, racists, and drug addicts. Soon, a nipple-driven race war erupts. 
Morty and Summer try to convince Rick to return home for the good of the planet, but Rick dismisses them and continues partying with Unity. Back at the Smith house, the alien rips itself out of its bindings and freaks out because he's sick and tired of hearing about Beth and Jerry's constant bickering. He escapes the garage, still in a huff. The fun can't last forever, and Unity breaks up with Rick. Rick returns home, and Beth musters up the courage to tell Rick that he can't have secret lairs anymore without consulting the family. Rick retires to the garage, where he gets drunk and narrowly evades a suicide attempt. End of episode. So, yeah, this one's pretty rough. I guess, should we talk about, I guess since we're all so affected by the suicide attempt scene, why don't we just talk about that? Uh, to start off, Let's get the depressing stuff out of the way, you know, yeah. yeah, get that stuff out of the way. Um, so why do you guys think this affected you so much? To me, it's just like the, the, the very idea that Rick literally is like a God, has everything he wants and could want and can do anything and is still someone who could you know, want to kill himself is depressing to me, Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, but in a, in a profound way, not in, uh, it wasn't a cheap shot, you know, like it, Mm -hmm. it's like, what does that say about him? What does that say about us? Mm -hmm. I don't know. What do you think? For me, he's like, he's like the, the, or he's like Saitama from one punch man, but way, way further. (laughs) Bored with his omnipotence or his godlike powers. But uh, Rick is like, I want to die because of it almost. And for some reason, I don't know why, but the fact that he kills the little blob thing first and he's like all sad while he does it makes it just so much more depressing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Why do you think I'm not he does exactly that? sure why. He, he killed but... it because he, he's obeying Be- uh, Beth. Remember? Beth's like, no more little slave monsters yeah. uh, in your uh, experimenting. Oh. He's like, okay, fine. Oh, and he yeah. goes and then he kills the, his little his little pet guy. And then that's cool because filmically we get to see how what mm-hmm. the laser does and then mm-hmm. yeah. turns it on himself. Wow. I think, too, like, something that struck me about that suicide attempt is, like, it comes right after this period where he's, like, back in his glory days with Unity, and he Mm -hmm. wants to keep partying. Like, he's the guy that wants to keep it going, and it's like, she's moved on, and and, and sort of that life has moved on. And it makes me think of that, and, like, you see that in people sometimes. Uh, I think I'm around the age where a lot of people go through that, where, like, you look back, and it's like, things will never be like that again. Is life moving forward just this boring mess and and more specifically like she says that he's the type of guy that has a personality that rubs off on other yeah. people you know which you can see in every character literally in the show and and i know people like that too yeah. you know where it's like yeah like when they come in like the world revolves around them for better or worse and people want you know either because people want their affection or whatever yeah. and then uh, uh and just the fact that you know, he's a happy guy, it seems yeah. like, generally, especially when he was with you. And, he, and why do you want to kill him? Well, it's like that guy that when he's 25, everyone wants to be around him. You want to have him over for the weekend. And he's 35 living the same way. Right. It's like, is he coming yeah. over again? No. <laughs> it's kind of like we the main a, character in The World's End. Yeah. Like, he never changes. Oh, and right. Like, with Rick, he realizes that he has, like, these godlike powers and he's so smart. But I think where he gets depressed is where he realizes, like, other people don't automatically like him all the time even though he could do all those things yeah yeah for me the thing i was reflecting on this time when i watched it is how he in the end realizes that he is toxic to people he's close to in two folds one to unity because she Mm -hmm. basically just straight up tells him that uh, i lose who i am and become part of you and it's not good for me but then similarly as soon as he gets home from being rejected by unity beth comes up to him and basically like you can see has to like muster up the courage to stand up to him Mm -hmm. and tell him that you know all right you you can't just do these things i'm standing up to you because you're ruining my marriage and you're uh compromising the family and stuff like that so it's basically just raining shit on Rick when he gets home because mm-hmm. you know it's especially two females that he loves he realizes that he's got a negative effect on them mm-hmm. and so I don't know in a very sick macabre way I wonder if that suicide attempt is almost half an expression of love kind of like you know maybe maybe my daughter's better off without me or maybe Unity's yeah. better off yeah. without me mm. oh for sure yeah all right are we done being depressed yeah. Okay. <laughs> cool. Well, let's uh, let's talk about freedom, because okay. uh, this is I a... love freedom. Yeah. <laughs> Even after this episode. Oh no, oh no! I just meant in general. The concept. Okay. <laughs> so um, the the big thing, and we, we've talked about this in a couple of our videos, but uh, kind of the 
focal or the central illusion is going on here is to the movie Invasion of the Body Snatchers. So in Invasion of the Body Snatchers, kind of similar to Unity, people are being replaced with exact replicas of each other. And uh, an alien presence attempts to wipe individuality from the face of the planet in order to simplify things and make life more peaceful. Now, the interesting thing here is that this is largely interpreted at the time as to be a criticism of McCarthyism or a criticism, ironically, of kind of communism yeah. in Russia and stuff like that. So um, it's interesting how you can say that one as a reaction to communism of a conformity of opinion under the the terror of McCarthy. And on the other hand, the, uh, you know, obviously like legal conformity under uh, Soviet era communism. Mm -hmm. So the great thing about this episode is it takes that premise of Invasion of the Body Snatchers and completely inverts it. Um, and instead of the paranoia of, oh my God, like what would a world where everyone is the same be like? That sounds like a dystopia. It kind of inverts it and shows us that actually, or perhaps a world in which their uh, individuality runs amok, you know, leads to things like race wars and stuff like <laughs> pedophilia. that. Pedophilia. And pedophilia and stuff like that. And even when he lands on Unity's planet, we see these shots of, like, everyone just watering their lawns and everybody getting along. And mm -hmm. it's just this peaceful, seeming paradise until Rick gets there. Um, so I'm just going to read a quote, and then we can kind of talk about our reflections on this. So one of uh, Unity's people says, Summer, before I took over this planet, this man was a registered sex offender. And then Summer says, yeah, well, so what? At least he was himself. And then another person says, this one was a drug addict on the verge of suicide. Now she's a marine biologist. I had transformed life here into a paradise. Prostitutes are now scientists. The homeless are now philosophers. So, um, and They're then... Philosophers. Philosophers. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, and then Morty has a great quote. He mm -hmm. says, listen, Unity, I don't think my sister's trying to say that life would be perfect without you. I think she's just saying that life would be, you know, life. <laughs> Um, so yeah. I think that Thomas brought up a great point about Saitama because uh, One Punch Man is very much about uh, the struggles of a life without conflict and in a sense when everyone is kind of united under a single disposition and a single personality, there isn't that conflict. And without that conflict, where's life, man? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was well, it's kind of like the, the central debate here is where, uh, from what perspective do you judge the value of life? Because if you look at it, say an ant colony, right? Um, none of those individual drones really has a whole lot of individuality or freedom of expression, but as a whole, that colony achieves great things, at least from an outward view, right? So where is the value in life? Is the value defined by what you see the actual colony as a whole do, or is it the value of life defined by the individual experience of an ant? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> but, uh, uh, I mean... The, the 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 idea of the, the the fact that they don't have the freedom to choose they don't have they're mm -hmm. not consenting in this situation like the people under unity's spell i mean i think that 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 that's where the value of life is is the fact that people the, the people being aware free thinking free willing mm -hmm. individuals being aware of what they're doing yeah like that's kind of where the perspective comes from yeah. but yeah well, i mean really, you bring up a good point yeah. Now, it's like a too nerdy with it, but this really reminds me of a lot of debates in like 18th and 19th century German philosophy, like stuff around, you know, from Kant to Hegel and the, the, the relationship between freedom and reason. So like if reason is a consistent structure, do you necessarily have to be free to follow the patterns and structures of reason or is freedom preferable to reason, even if it's to be crass, like wrong? Mm -hmm. um, and, right. and you kind of like there's the bad readings you might get in a you know freshman seminar on Hegel where the whole point for Hegel is you know the unity of world spirit um, combines all subjectivity with objectivity in a consistent rational structure um, which is a bad reading of Hegel but I think that's like a version of what's going on with unity like is it better if everyone is following the same principles of reason it's also kind of like a metaphor for America, you know. Like we, Whoa. we, ex mm -hmm. we accept like, fr you know, we want all these these freedoms, but we, you know, you got to accept that a, b a bunch of bad shit happens. That's yeah. like like the gun debate's right. the perfect example, you know. It's like yeah, everyone should be free to have giant weapons, but then you know that comes with 
our weekly or bi-monthly shootings you know i mean it's kind of like yeah. well is, yeah is that preferable is, yeah. you know is our freedom you know how much freedom do we want well it is that whole debate between like yeah is is your is freedom in general worth sacrificing rational moral or political principles that you hold to be true like where is that line so what would the better mm -hmm. reading of hegel be in that situation i mean the better reading of hegel would almost be that like rick serves as this point of like a organic inconsistency or contradiction which forces reason to adapt the the more like large-scale better reason reading of hegel is that uh world spirit literally just means the uh collective of reason at that point in history so it's mm -hmm. not like a magical zeitgeist spiritual reason yeah so it's just like what, wherever we're currently at as a culture philosophically and intellectually is the you know spirit of the age like you just said mm. um and then the the point for I mean, there's the point where when Morty talks about like life and life kind of being messy, I think that would be the the good reading of Hegel, mm -hmm. um, that life itself, like as a concept, is messy and inconsistent, and we have to acknowledge that because if we act as if life can be a perfectly unified structure, um, we're, we're just going to be beating our heads against the wall. So in that reading, mm -hmm. I know that people get people get <laughs> angry if you use the word dialectic with Hegel. Without mentioning uh, oh, Fichte, yeah. but um, so in that reading, Rick then would be doing a service to Unity because he is kind of the antithesis that allows her to realize something about herself. She, at the end, she has this uh, epiphany that she says, um, "You can't change. I have no problem with that, but clearly it means that I have a problem with myself, and I'm sure there's no perfect version of me. I'm sure I'll just unify species after species, and never be complete." So, would you say, in a sense, that Rick? is actually ultimately beneficial to unity in her in her journey to create to be a god as she well, says yeah you could say that he's a, a force of negativity so he's a, a force of negativity in her consistent system uh that forces a modification or progression to that system okay and i think like in a weird way like it's fine to talk about dialectics without mentioning fichte by the way uh, i hereby <laughs> grant you permission forever uh, um, thank you doctor but but yeah i think that like maybe negativity is a better way to think of 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 his role in that, which then shows the importance of, of negativity in general. If it's not for the negation of a system or the negation of a form of reason or just a form of subjectivity, there's nothing like pushing you uh, to, to keep progressing. So at the end of it, unity uh, is, is at a higher level. She has a, a bigger level of self-understanding uh, moving forward. So if, mm. if we were to believe that it was strictly Hegelian, would it be that when rick and morty descend onto the planet that we see that the planet has issues and needs that negativity in order to adapt or is it not necessarily that is the does the negativity kind of um find itself into a society that isn't necessarily showing clear problems but it still is able to evolve and adapt yeah i mean i guess the the, the where the hegel analogy probably breaks down is that in a hegelian system uh negativity happens internal to structure Mm -hmm. Right. So like uh, Rick and Morty and Summer are kind of this external thing that pops into that world. I guess you could then to get way too meta and nerdy about it, say that like if the multiverse itself is a system that's still can, like internal to that thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. but yeah. OK. Too much Hegel before noon. Sorry for bringing it up. No, it's OK, man. <laughs> Sorry, that's, Thomas. That's cool. I don't even know who Hegel is. So <laughs> Don't never look it up. I have more <laughs> philosophy expertise than I do. I kind of saw Rick's entrance as like a commentary on a single point of failure because since everyone has lost their individuality, they're kind of at the mercy of uh, Unity's control over the system and Rick just like basically turns off that control and then a bunch of bad things happen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's talk about, uh, well... Okay, so then there's the awesome line that Summer says to kind of put a pin on this whole thing as she says, I didn't know freedom meant people doing stuff that sucks. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. was the best, that's the best oh. line in the whole episode. Yeah, yeah. I, I yeah. laughed yeah. out loud by myself at that line again because it's so, but it's so like pure. That's such like a yeah. pure thing that like we all think freedom is great, but now it means a race war is broken out because of nipple design. Yeah. <laughs> because of freedom. Yeah, yeah. Because of freedom. Well, I mean, it's extreme. It's a very uh, misanthropic view. It's just that oh, as soon as someone becomes an individual, they automatically become racist. <laughs> and the first, the first thing that he says when he regains consciousness is, "I'm an electrical engineer, father of two, and as you can see from my flat con 
concentric nipple rings, I'm a member of this planet's top race. Yeah. <laughs> What's well, weird, like, race comes up a couple times, too, because the second line of the episode is Rick calling cops racist. Oh, yeah, when they yeah, first that part's gonna... hilarious. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they're profiling the aliens. Yeah, it's so, like, yeah. literal. <laughs> and, well, you know what I found out after watching it a second time? So he says that, you know, oh, I'm going to spray paint this thing so it looks like the core blocks did it. A core block is what the guy in the basement is. He's blim oh, blam the yeah. core block. Oh, I didn't catch that. Shit. Yeah. Cool detail. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, now, <laughs> this might be going way too deep, but so blim blam says later in the episode that he's on that planet to eat babies. And so initially when I first read that, I'm like, oh, okay, so core blocks eat babies. But that's generalizing that may be a racist inclination for me to think that Whoa. because i can't even believe maybe, you said that out loud maybe mm. not all core blocks <laughs> eat babies maybe just blim blam is a particularly bad core block everyone and start that the core hashtag hashtag bad not all core blocks yeah hashtag not all core blocks <laughs> <Eat> babies <laughs> <laughs> not they don't all eat babies and try to spread space aids <laughs> as as you call it <laughs> yeah um <laughs> So, yeah, let's, let's talk about the B-plot with Beth and Jerry and Blim Blam. Mm. What would you guys think about this? Hilarious. I, l I love it. Yeah. Yeah, it's really funny. So do you guys mm. – uh, so Jerry's argument is that Rick walks all over her because of her abandonment issues. Um, do you guys buy this? Do you think that Jerry is, like, right in this episode? Do you think that – Yeah. Because uh, Beth, yeah. Beth seems to be – Always yeah, defending Rick to ridiculous extents. But that's like the one area that Jerry always tends to be right. It, it is is when he points out the the issues that Beth has because of Rick. Yeah, yeah. he always articulates them pretty well. Like I think the show kind of directs away from that a little bit because it's so it makes so clear that Jerry is like a weak man who has a lot of flaws. But I think he is right about that. Like it, Beth does let Rick walk all over the family. Yeah, and I think in this season too, it really continues to build that Beth is is both damaged by Rick and secretly way more like Rick than she'd ever want to acknowledge. Well, the, mm -hmm. and to what extent are we to believe that what Blim Blam says to them is is a like a, an authentic and correct intervention? Because he says you both hate yourselves and each other. The idea that it has anything to do with Rick is laughable. But I think to what you guys just said, I think that we are meant to believe that it has something to do with Rick. Yeah. Yeah, or at least he's something that exacerbates the issue. Well, yeah, I, I think what Blim Blam was just saying is that it begins and ends with them, and Rick yeah. is just like, yeah, Rick's in the picture, but even if Rick wasn't, you know, they still have issues. Well, it's, yeah, that, it's like any mm -hmm. of us could blame stuff on our parents, let's say, but that's a way of avoiding our, our own issues or maybe avoiding, like, progressing as right. people. So by, by focusing on Rick... It's a way to avoid talking about their marriage, their disappointment in themselves. Yeah. All that yeah. That's all blim blam means. Yeah, yeah. there are some times during their argument right. where she says, nothing is ever good enough for you, Jerry, and Jerry says, you know, you're a child or something like that. So, And, and it's kind of cool because, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is kind of the, uh, the first time that this through line starts where kind of the show kind of becomes, I feel like, yeah. about – you know, the relationships in the family more, or at least, like, Beth's and, and Rick's relationship, especially in the third season. So I feel like this is kind of the seed You mean of Beth that. and Jerry? No, I mean, oh, yeah, yeah, Beth, Jerry, and Rick. Yeah, but yeah. just how Rick factors into the whole equation of the family. For sure. You know? Yeah, it's, yeah. it's been seeded a couple times. Uh, let's see, in even as early as the Shemalians episode, there is, uh, there was a whole plot a subplot developed devoted to it though? yeah because like Jerry's in the in the simulation during uh, that oh yeah yeah, yeah 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 there's like the the Beth that basically doesn't move and only says one word and it's like the best time he's ever had with Beth <laughs> which is really sad who here is a Star Trek fan I wish I was more of one I like it Burns you're not a Star yeah, Trek I'm fan? in that boat I'm not all right I'm not either really but I do <laughs> okay. I, I was able to recognize that there are a number of Star Trek jokes here so mm -hmm. um Let's talk about Beta 7, the hive Definitely mind. Definitely a Borg yeah. joke. Yeah. Definitely a Borg joke. Tell us a little bit about the Borg, <laughs> Thomas. Uh, so my understanding of the Borg, having only seen those episodes when I was a kid, is that uh, the Borg, I guess, so like the whole idea of Unity and of Beta 7 especially is a reference to the Borg, which is a hive mind um, that has a queen. So I guess with the Borg, the hive mind has a physical embodiment. It didn't seem like Unity had one, or at least it wasn't shown. And the Borg assimilate people 
Uh, and I guess their goal is to assimilate all life forms, except for, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the Klingons, which the Borg think are unworthy of being assimilated, but everyone else should oh. be assimilated into their race. Mm. And I guess they, uh, I don't know what they do, but they eventually put a bunch of technological crap into your face, uh, kill your individuality, and turn you into a drone for the hive. You know what? Uh, actually, in our Ghost in the Shell episode that we made about a year ago, we talked about the Borg in relation to Hegel. Oh, uh, nice. Because oh, yeah. uh, isn't it that the Borg assimilates other people into their culture in order to evolve? I think so. Ooh. But again, I, I don't have a whole lot of Star Trek expertise. So. Okay, yeah, it's a shame that I'm Alec sure isn't here because Alec here. is the <laughs> resident Star Trek nerd yeah. at Wisecrack, but uh, he is visiting his brother at the moment. Um, mm. But so... Thomas, from what you remember, is the Borg, like, I mean, in, in, when you compare them to Beta 7, like, Beta 7 is much more schlubby than the Borg. The Borg are, like, badasses, right? I don't know. Well, the Borg, the drones kind of look, uh, I don't know. They don't look badass. They look kind of weird, but they're definitely stronger. I don't know. Like, Beta 7 is clearly, it's, Beta 7 is, like, a cross between a Borg reference and a joke about the guy who's always friend zoned that yeah. the girl always runs back right. to but like, isn't the like guy beta she actually likes is the joke is an that is yeah, a joke that he's like a quote yeah. beta male. I yeah, thought he's a beta so. male. Yeah. Like, yeah. You guys saw the end of credits bit of yeah. this episode, yeah. right? Where he's like outside of Beta Seven's giant fortress trying to get Unity yeah. back. I really like the He's just like being bit. the friend zone protector. Yes, the friend zone protector. <laughs> and so, I just... yeah, the Borg's definitely like not that, but I wouldn't call them like super badass. They're just more scary. I just love that Beta Seven has like this sad gut, you know. Yeah. That, yeah. Like it's and Pat he's just Oswald. Kind of, yeah, it looks it's just like him. Like oh, really? Yeah. Okay, that's funny. I <laughs> yeah. can. Um, cool. Well, I want to move on to just some of the funniest parts of this episode because yeah. I think there's a lot. Um, do you guys have any favorites you want to shout out real quick? We already talked about mine. Was the uh, man freedom? I didn't know. That I mean, when that's one of the best lines of the whole things. show. Yeah, I really liked. Uh, yeah. When Morty turns to Summer and says, "Oh, Summer." First race war, huh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would love to see some of the previous race wars that he's been in, yeah. And then, of course... I'm going to quote you on that, Jerry. Yeah. And I don't want to steal anyone's thunder if this is on there, but when Rick says, like, uh, not looking for judgment, just a yes or no, can you assimilate a draft? Well, the fun, <laughs> I don't know. It took me until, like, the third time I watched it to realize this, but... So after he says that, it then it cuts back to a Beth and Jerry scene, but then yeah. when it cuts back... You see the giraffe, and he looks like he's been Tired. horribly damaged. He looks like he's yeah. been violated. He's yeah, through hell. <laughs> it's like yeah, Not post-traumatic good. draft. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, that uh, I did not notice that small... for a while. Yeah. Oh, uh, another amazing moment that like was funny and also I think a good character moment for Rick is when he thinks he believes that the town next o over was was <gasps> yeah. a nuclear bombed mm -hmm. by new unity and everyone's oh, yeah. cheering and he's just like what you know like yeah, that actually affects him it's one of the few things that you know like oh wow a whole two town got nuked and that it's yeah. just a yep. joke ha ha <laughs> <We're laughs> like, funny. And then there's the moment where they're like stadium banging, I think, and there's oh, all the redheads, yeah. but then oh, the yeah. crowd is like, you can do it, son, or like something like that. Because they're all his father. No, it's all his dad. That was wild. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, I'm pretty sure you can see a couple frames of his dong when he's on, when he when, when he's flying. Because they wouldn't allow that. I mean, it's very amorphous. I mean, it's not a very well-defined dong. When, when he looks like Uncle Sam or whatever Yeah, because he says, because when he specifies yeah. what, costume he wants he says a crotchless uncle sam <laughs> yeah uh, outfit <laughs> and from the previous episode you know they like try to get as close as they can to the line because when jerry's wandering through the alien town there's that weird either single alien that looks like two aliens having sex or possibly two aliens actually having sex i don't know but it's like just weird enough for them to allow to be on TV. <laughs> We've talked about how much like there are just phallic and yonic images all over this show. I mean, even mm -hmm. even the the alien that's stuck in the basement has. I mean, there are so many. Yeah. They has little testicle chin. I mean, but like it seems like yeah. most aliens in this show have <laughs> testicle chins or testicle heads or something. Right. It's just testicles everywhere. Speaking of that imagery, um, did you guys notice any of that in Man of Steel? If you watched it. It's been a long time since I've seen it. I haven't seen it since theaters. Man, the Kryptonian ships, like every door, is it's just oh. <laughs> and then like the <laughs> the the thing they launch um, Zod up into the negative zone with, just, it looks like a giant phallus. 
You know, I don't know what they we were doing. Don't with do, we don't do we don't do enough Zack Snyder stuff on the podcast <laughs> because whether or not you like his movies, he definitely like tries you know i i actually yes. we, oh, yeah. we almost did batman v superman for show me the meaning our movie podcast this week but yeah. uh we delayed it we're gonna do it soon though and ryan can't wait because he right. loves that oh, movie <laughs> bottom you 10 for me Snyder, like a low effort director i just think like he puts way too much stock into moments rather than a cohesive story see i think that he puts a lot of stock in the moments in his first couple movies and it paid off you know like those 300 and yes it did and whatever like and then i think he just kind of tries to replicate that every time out and you know hasn't but really with, hit with it. watchman with 300 he was adapting a single story pretty closely yeah he needs to do uh, that with oh, and dawn of the dead though hey, i love you know i'm a watchman apologist i think that movie's awesome me too i uh, love that movie yeah um anyway so who here is a community fan uh, yeah, that, that was a funny reference. Yeah, three yeah. seasons. Did you guys, Medium, medium level community fan. Did yeah. you guys notice the community joke? It goes by very quickly. Uh huh. So he cancels it. Yeah. So he's he's looking at the TV. He's sitting next to <gasps> Unity. Oh, cancel! I'll bring it back. Cancel! Bring it back. And then he says, uh, "They just put you." He says, "Like, don't waste your brain on those weirdos." You know, he's talking about Morty and Summer. They're no different from any of the aimless chumps that you occupy. They just put you at the center of their lives because you're powerful. And then because they put you there, they want you to be less powerful. Never let that happen, right? And then it says never. And like you see, like it's like maybe like half a second you see on the screen. There's basically an alien, alien form alien version of the cast of community oh. looks at the screen and says never and so i guess by saying and because they put you there they want you to be less powerful is i guess dan Harmon throwing shade at the execs that yeah like fired him and then rehired him wow that sounds yeah, like, is... yeah. or they now guess what happened reference in there yeah i don't know crazy man you know one thing i wish we saw more of uh jerry's awkward urban lingo that's like it's a joke at the beginning <laughs> yeah. and then as soon as he says now you're going to keep hating this play or are you going to jack my steez uh -huh. and then she's jack like now steez. and now you're just making stuff up but then it just dies like he doesn't do it anymore and mm -hmm. I, I was like oh man why didn't they continue with that yeah cool that I, I feel so like if fun. they had continued it would have gotten old i think that's like one of those jokes where it's just random and if it sticks around for a while it's funny yeah they certainly didn't they shouldn't have overdone it for they probably sure. cut one yeah. or two then we just didn't see it i just would have liked maybe it came up like at the end again or yeah. maybe like i don't know maybe the alien does yeah. has the same lingo and jerry's <laughs> able to communicate with him through but... like <laughs> Uh, like semi-ironic yeah. urban lingo i feel like they have to use that one sparingly like, though because like that. yeah because like the cultural trope of like lame white guy that uses urban lingo wears thin real quick <laughs> so oh, maybe I, it's something yeah. we like yeah. they want to leave us wanting more rather than that's right i mean, I, mean I, I, I want more so i guess yeah. they, they did something good <laughs> i agree but just jerry doing it though to <laughs> yeah. me transcends it because he is the <laughs> ultimate lame one yeah guy, you yeah know? of course so it's like it's like he he would has to do it yeah it would be weird for him not to and i think it where it plays better in an animated setting i think as well than like a a human lame white right, guy yeah. doing that stuff yeah. definitely like steve if you watch steve martin bringing down the house with queen latifah now it is so cringe worthy wait man. that that didn't age really well <laughs> no <laughs> no I wait, 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 wait. how many stuff? times have you seen <laughs> bringing down the house with queen latifah and steve <laughs> more martin? than i'd like to admit but why God, how, how has it happened because we had it on DVD in my house, and you know, it was just oh, like so it's a family put, favorite. No, it just is a fa it's just around the family. It just we have a big DVD collection. Oh my collection god, I just remembered doing. parts of that. Doesn't Steve Martin wear like a do rag at one point? Yeah, he goes in and yeah. he just like walks into the club oh, and is trying to dance. Boy. You know, like it's stupid. <laughs> But there, I mean, it's not just that movie. There's like a whole. There was like that's a like decade, a subgenre. Oh, it, it was called the like '90s that. and early <laughs> 2000s. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, it's called a trend. Yeah. So on the subject of Jerry being kind of like the, the I don't know the weak man or the beta man or like the ultimate like suburban white guy, I just started watching Archer last night mm. and realized that uh, Cyril's voice actor is, is Jerry. Yeah, yeah, and it fits so well. Yeah, but he's I amazing. wonder if Dan Harmon uh, picked that voice actor specifically because he was almost trying to like write a Cyril into the show. Oh. Well, Chris Parnell is just a funny guy too because it's that's who does it, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Is that him? Okay. Yeah, Fun he's trivia a... fact, he grew up a mile away from me in Memphis, Tennessee. Wow. Oh, cool. Oh, wow. <laughs> cool. Never met so him, So that's though. where funny guys with great voices come from. Oh, God. Oh. Thanks, Dr. <laughs> Nihilist. No. Oh, you know what? Fuck off. <laughs> I, I take it back. Rewind that. My favorite comments that we've gotten recently is that Ryan 
has a fat voice. <laughs> <laughs> you 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 know what I'm talking yeah, about? People see one. people see Ryan and like, wow, I'm really surprised he's not fat. He has a very fat voice. <laughs> You're so, oh. so Ryan, nasal, your, yes. your voice needs nasal to lose weight, bro. I'm trying to imagine you as just like morbidly obese now. Keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> His eyes are closed, everyone. <laughs> All right, does anyone else want to bring anything up before we move into the mailbag about this episode? Um, so we, you guys asked about the funny things? Yes, go for it. I just love when the the cone nipple guy calls the other guy a ripple nipple bastard. <laughs> oh, like he said, that. yeah, yeah. It, it, we see like the racial epithets he called the, one of them. The guy with the the target, <laughs> the target nipples called the guys like a knife nipple, yeah. jackass or something <laughs> like that. My, my and then oh sorry go. Oh, I was just gonna say for uh, this isn't really funny, but the way Rick says dumb when Summer's like, what are, can you do it for me? He's just like, dumb. I'd love that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And just like the, he's in like a sombrero with like, yeah, with like bullets. <laughs> with like a mustache. Yeah. That's pretty incredible. Yeah. Um, and I do like the moment at the very end, I guess, where we learn that he just wants to cure space AIDS to market it and make money. A little mm-hmm. uh, pharmaceutical yeah. exploitation reference there. It's very balanced how the, whatever, Blim Blam tells them that, yes, you're both right. Yes, yeah. he wants to cure space age, but it's not for benevolent reasons. It's because yeah. he's an asshole. Yeah. One thing about Blim Blam, I loved the Blim Blam scene, but my suspension of disbelief was a little stretched whenever he said, I could have, you know, it oh, It took you guys to make me escape, you know? Yeah. It's like you're being held captive in this basement. It's like, and you could escape and you didn't. I don't believe you, Blim Blam. So, yeah. are, are we to believe that when he leaves the garage, he's just, he's like, fuck this planet? Is he going to eat babies? Oh, or yeah. is, Does he, he, is he, I think he's getting off the planet. Point, or he just leaves. He just leaves. He leaves the yeah, planet. Yeah, I feel like he is out. Because he's just like, fuck these two people. Humanity isn't even worth yeah. destroying. I don't even want to eat people. their babies. Yeah. yeah, he's very disappointed with the speed of a suburban garage door as well. That really seemed to be I the... I think uh... the slowest door ever line was just kind of like thrown in there and maybe could have been reworked into a little better joke. I don't know. Yeah, because he had just yeah. said the worst about them. And then he yeah. said, slowest door ever. Which Isn't is that like, like the same joke. The middle finger helped, though, for me. Like, slowest yeah. door ever, and then, like, yes. the middle finger. For whatever <laughs> well, reason, that, that did it for me. That whole, like, blank thing ever, like, even that intonation, is not is that just a comic book guy from The Simpsons joke? That, that's just a that's just is something it? that did it, but did it originate came into that? parlance. I don't believe so. Yeah, I don't know. You don't talk yeah, about, to me, that makes me think more about... of, like, I do. I always think of, like, like the clueless world when I think of that of something uh, like worse something ever okay I think of uh, equals three videos from back in the day where like they'd be like cutest fur little bastard ever if someone out there could tell us where blank blank ever originated yeah we, that would help uh, us out best week yeah, ever VH1 historians. done <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well I would, more than just the blank blank ever it's that the way he says yeah. it because isn't the comic book guy just like Ugh, worst convention ever or something yeah. like that mm. <laughs> that was a good <laughs> oh thank <laughs> you that was, a, that was nice <laughs> thank you I, I, I'm good at like getting my fat voice out <laughs> I was gonna say you sounded you sounded like always... husky not fat okay. like like bigger but when I look at you I'd be like oh but he, he should be that big okay like, yeah Whereas Ryan's voice is just always morbidly just, obese. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 200 pounds uh, over. <laughs> I hear Ryan's voice and I just buy a bunch of insulin and send it to Wisecrack for Ryan just in case. That was you? Oh yeah. my God. Oops. <laughs> Secret angel. All right, guys, let's go into the mailbag. So this one is from Mads. Mads says, Hey, Squanchers, there seems to be some confusion among you. Or rather, Ryan was confused. Ooh. Alec and Jared just didn't give a shit as to why the, <laughs> we got as, so many emails about Goodbye Moon Men. As to, as to why the line "Goodbye Moon Men" was repeated several times when Fart sings to Morty. So this is actually about your favorite episode, Thomas. Uh, how oh, I, I was wondering why you guys were confused about this. I was listening to your episode. On oh, okay. This. However, I believe the answer is evident if you look at the rest of the lyrics. The worlds can be one together, cosmos without hatred. All the Moon Men want things their way, but we want their way but we make sure they see the sun goodbye moon man the way i see it is fart is saying there could be peace and unity throughout the universe but the carbon-based inhabitants of it i.e aliens or moon men are keeping this from happening to fix this fart is planning to cleanse all carbon-based life forms and is saying goodbye because well everyone's going to die so is is that how you read it as well thomas yeah exactly like see the sun just like you're gonna be burned away basically yeah i I honestly, after re-listening to the episode, I 
I myself was like, why am I so confused about that? <laughs> I agree with everyone out there. Sorry. <laughs> Though the imagery is so weird. Vaped a little too much that day. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> All right, this next one is from, and I'm going to mess this up, Newt, K-N-U-T-E. K-N-U-T, Newtie. Nudie. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so this is a uh, last week we briefly were talking about how growing up today, like in middle school in the age of Instagram and social media, actually Bo Burnham just made a movie about this. Yeah. Did you see it yet? I haven't. I'm excited to see I'm it. I'm excited <laughs> to see it too. Uh, but we were talking about how, I mean, I would not want to be in their place. It seems pretty harrowing. But uh, so this is from, what was it again? Newt. Uh, it's Newt. Like uh, Newt Rock. Was there an I at the end? No. Oh, never mind. I was wrong. Okay. You were right. So he says, I'm 14. I would like to say I love your podcast and videos. At the beginning of your podcast of Season 2, Episode 2, I couldn't stop thinking about what you said about the difficulties of being young today. I would just like to give my opinion to tell you that growing up today also has many benefits, such as equality rights and growing up in an atmosphere where it's easier to feel more accepted than ever. I do not live, or I do live in a white suburbia, but I still believe that things are better than they were. I know this has nothing to do with the episode, but I hope it helps. Well, I'm glad to have gotten this email because I'm always super paranoid and always a technophobe and I'm always just like, oh, social media is making everyone worse and more anxious and more depressed. But uh, it's uh, good to hear this other. Yeah. Can, can I make a couple of arguments for why it's good? Yeah. So uh, my best friend and I often talk about this. So I graduated in 09 from high school for context. And obviously this is not going to be universal but we often make the observation that it just seems like now it's so much less cool to be a bully hot topic isn't about being like depressed and cutting yourself it's about just like memes and shows like a lot of things have changed to where it's like not as okay to be a crappy person uh -huh. and huh. clearly not universal but at least when i was in school it seemed like it was a lot cooler, quote unquote, to be a bully or to, to be, be an asshole. asshole. You know what I think the be yeah. the best embodiment of this is? <laughs> 21 Jump Street. 21 Jump Street, yeah, absolutely. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Just especially, thinking that. especially because Josh Hartnett's character comes in basically embodying Channing Tatum. I'm sorry, what mm -hmm. did I say? Josh Hartnett. <laughs> Whatever, they look the exact same. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> do they not? I just think Channing Tatum's so much better. Probably. <laughs> yeah, he goes, he's like, he's like you just got to beat the shit out of somebody on your first day of school, and everyone will respect yeah, you. Yeah, right? and then he punches someone else. Those were the social then, rules when yeah. I was in high school. Uh, and then, like, yeah. he beats, Dave Franco's he, 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 like, what the fuck, dude? What the fuck, man? Yeah. He, and, and, then the, and, and then he, like, calls him gay, and he's like, whoa, that's not cool. Like, he actually is gay. And, <laughs> and, and uh, yeah. you know, it's like, it's Wait, cooler to be sensitive. Can I be the downer on this one? Yeah. Please. I'm okay. sorry for, what was the, the guy's name who asked this question? Newt. I don't know. Newt. Okay, man, I don't want to be a jerk to you, but. Um, the one thing that I'll say is when I was growing up, like there weren't literal Nazis in the country, and yeah, I yeah there were were no 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 no, no 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 there were literal I Nazis but like brothers. the way in which like that stuff it's weird like it's like less there's certain words we can't use and identity stuff is way better I totally agree but we also live in a world yeah. where like there's like colleges now where like people show up with their assault rifles and walk around to like prove their rights we have like alt right groups and like stuff like that that are way more visible. Than they ever were before. I don't so know, man. I think that if you'd go back in time, there's been shit like that throughout. You're just saying the, the, more the, visible, the internet makes it more visible and allows yeah, it to. Yeah, I definitely yeah, agree yeah. with that. That we right. all are more aware of the shitty yeah. part of our society, and that's kind of a well, weird so thing. I, but, but I feel like it's yeah. easier to be accepted all around. So like uh, stuff like gender, race, way more easy to be accepted. But if you're also just like real far out there, that you can also find spaces yeah. like of acceptance, right? Uh, That's the problem. Yeah. Terrorists. And, and I've even seen Where this like. People can be validated no matter how bad their views are because yeah. people only need a few other people to validate them and then they will be defensive against the people who come against them rather than yeah. just slinking back. But whatever. Newt's so a good guy. And I know that. he's out there fighting for good stuff. Right, Newt? Well, and, and Jared, you talked about the Bo Burnham, right? The, you know, kind of have, uh, the eighth grade movie coming out that is yeah. about this. And he was on the other day on the H3H3 H3 podcast, and he kind of said, he kind of touched on this, on how, the and I found it to be true, too, that, like, younger kids don't, like, they're actually way more self-aware about this stuff than I feel like we realize. And it's really, like, 30-year-olds with the, that are the, the most mm -hmm. fucked up about social media and stuff because you yeah. know we're kind of we didn't grow up with it and it's kind of like this you know like our perspective is we were saying oh man these kids must be fucked up yeah. because they they're they're growing up with this stuff when in reality they're aware of that and well, they know yeah. that they're aware the, of what though they're like, aware I, that, I, that, that, that they're 
they obviously didn't live, uh, grow up without it, but they're aware that this stuff is screwing with their perception. I do feel like yeah. that. Yeah, and know, we grew up with, like, even, are. like, cable TV and the early internet. And I think, like, you know, you go back every generation, there's always a cultural paradigm that the generation before is like, right. oh, how are they going to turn out okay? You know, the way I think yeah. about this, and I think the, mo- the the thing that I was mostly talking about here is, like, you guys remember, did you ever have during, like, Valentine's Day, they had, like, uh, certain kids would get, like, carnations? Did you guys have that? So it was like we had little Valentine's Day cards that were passed out. I don't know about carnations. Okay, so in my school, it was that basically like on Valentine's Day, like the week leading up to Valentine's Day, basically like secret admirers or whatever would uh-huh. buy like these chocolate carnations for a dollar, and then at Valentine's oh, yeah. Day, like the mm. teacher would basically like announce yeah. who got the carnations, and of course, all the popular people would get a shit ton of carnations, and the not popular people would get none. Yeah. So I think, yeah. and of course, like for people that were not popular, including myself, that was just a humiliating day yeah. every single time. I feel like yeah. with Instagram and stuff like that, that phenomenon is every day because you're yeah. because like your popularity or how desirable you are is quantified with likes and shares and hashtags and all that shit every day yeah no so i think you're right like in a certain yeah. way back in the day our bullies were like analog mm-hmm. so like i don't know when I, I i got shit for stuff in school and then so you'd go to school you get shit um and you go home and you're away from it i couldn't have imagined being like an eighth grade getting shit at school going home and checking my social media and having those same people but maybe even around the Mm. world also giving me shit yeah or just like you know like oh man you can't come to my party unless you have over 500 instagram followers like i doubt that that actually oh my god yeah (laughs) Yeah, i guarantee you that that happens but i I, go to calabasas some party is like that i'm sure because like you were saying i did see recently a story about a, a mural on the side of a building and some company had blocked it off and you can only take a selfie in front of it if you have uh 10, followers or more <laughs> dude even at wow. vidcon at, I, I, at vidcon like you would get messages that like oh come to this exclusive party only if you have over a million subs it's like oh, come on yeah <laughs> whoa that's hilarious. did you go to that party yeah. thomas <laughs> no <laughs> why not thomas <laughs> I'm kidding because I, I don't want to go to a party where that's like front and center like it's so exclusive you can only come if you have a million subs like i don't want to be i don't well it's like in, if there are cool yeah. people there i don't want to be in that environment i would rather like meet a cool person just like i don't know at a hangout room or something i don't yeah. know well for anyone who sees sorry to bother you there's a fun scene about how vip rooms suck so oh, there yeah, you go. yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i hear you i also think that probably thomas you and i would probably not even get recognized in in that party. I don't think that the people who are into that party are probably into our content, but maybe I'm wrong. No, not really. I got recognized like twice at VidCon this year. Yeah. The funny thing is I got recognized far less this year than last year, even though last year my channel was half the size. It might just be the people that go to VidCon who are all wonderful people (laughs) if you're listening. Did it feel like VidCon was uh, more sparsely populated this year? I actually didn't go this year. I went last year, though. Oh, you didn't go this year. I was there. What'd you think? Well, I um, I hadn't been there the years before. It felt pretty packed to me. I mean, it, it, it might have also it been as much. maybe there wasn't as much security because, like, last year there was on the on the yeah that weird. Never mind. Did you go to Tanacon? <laughs> no. <laughs> what? <laughs> All right, moving on to the next one, um, guys. <laughs> Nacho Con this year was crazy. You all missed out. Uh, all right, this is the last one. <laughs> Uh, hey yo, Squanchers, greeting from New York City. Hi, Alec. Alec is not here. I just wanted to share with you a little detail on Morty Night Run that I haven't heard from anyone else. When Morty is playing Roy, he becomes completely immersed in the game and presumably loses all of his memories of his reality and spending a lifetime in it. When Rick is playing Roy, however, he's able to hold a conversation with Morty. So while Rick is living an alternate life, not to mention experiencing it at a vastly accelerated rate, he is still able to maintain his awareness of reality. Whether this was mm-hmm. intentional or a nod to Rick's unmatched mm-hmm. intelligence, I thought it was a fun little Easter egg. Keep up the bomb ass work from Nico. That's interesting. Hadn't thought about it. Well, he obviously yeah, he's played the game that. a lot, you know, because he's yeah. kind of fucking. What do you say? Cr- crash his score or wreck his score? Is he? No, he's like he takes him, him off the grid. Wreck your Roy score. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he takes him <laughs> off the grid. He's about to burn his social security card. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did notice how uh, Morty's eyes go in the back of his head. And then Rick is just able to talk to him. Yeah, it was kind of weird. I didn't really think they were trying to make a huge statement about it. It was more just like a, I don't know, f- like making the exchange funnier. It's a fun detail, though. It is yeah, yeah, that really is. And yeah, more to Thomas's point. Yeah, there's Crumbopulous Michael. There's the Moon Men song. There's the Roy game. It's a it's a good episode. 
Solid. It's, it's a solid, it's a solid favorite, Thomas. I'm sorry we couldn't have you on for your favorite. You just missed it. <laughs> That's all right. You guys didn't know. Uh, and the Garblovians are just the best. They make the best <laughs> noise. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, have any of you seen the um the little uh what is it Five Nights at Freddy's sort of tribute they did on YouTube? That Rick and Morty did. Yeah. I did not. Hmm. Is that new? They've done some pretty good little animation shorts. No, they did it as like a teaser or an in-between thing between seasons two and three. So they've got that. And there's also a Meeseeks pixelated art fighting video on the Adult Swim channel. Both of them are great. Huh. Oh, I'll have to check that out. The last Rick and Morty thing I saw was the uh, April Fool's joke with the Australian, the, Australian yeah. the Bendigo thing. That was fun. That was fun. I need to see that one still. Pretty weird. Uh, anyway, so before we go, just want to remind you guys, if you want to check out our two new pilots, head over to wisecrackplus.com. Included in those pilots, we also, so uh, Michael is, uh, he's just started a music podcast. We're still ironing out the kinks and everything, but that should be launching soon. Please listen to it when it comes out. Thanks. Yeah, we're going to upload the current cut onto Patreon. So if you guys are interested, uh, you can give us your feedback. We're always looking for feedback from our patrons. So if you want to join, it would be much appreciated. Uh, before we go, also want to tell you guys, please check out Thomas's podcast, the College Info Geek Podcast. It's, I mean, Thomas, actually, Thomas, what I did not tell you is one of our interns this semester is a huge fan. And when she thought that you were coming in physically, she kind of geeked out. I had to tell her, oh. unfortunately, you're not going to be making Damn. it physically. But she said <laughs> uh, that you saved her ass in college. So oh, that's awesome. Yeah, making nice. a difference. So anyway, Glad I could help. Check out Thomas's uh, podcast. Check out his YouTube channel. Uh, our collabs together have been some of the most successful ones. I don't know something about our our audience meshes. I don't know what it is. We're all a bunch of geeks. We're all a bunch of <laughs> we're all a bunch of fucking nerds. <laughs> all right. Uh, where can we find you guys on the internet, Ryan? You can find me on Ryan's Game Show and Ryan Shorts. This week, I had a, a collaboration with Wisecrack. We put out an HQ parody called WQ. And I, it's hilarious. I loved it. <laughs> I watched it twice and laughed both times. Good. Michael. Oh, you on Instagram, Michael O. Burns. Twitter, Mick underscore O underscore Broin. Listen to the Wisecrack music, music podcast if it comes out. Yay. Yay. Cool. And Thomas. Uh, Instagram, Tom Frankly, uh, same with Twitter, and then collegeinfogeek.com. Cool. I'm gonna catch those All stories. right, well, thank you so much for joining us, Thomas. we got to do it again, especially if there's, a, if there's a movie that you really dig, you should come on the movie podcast. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. And thanks for having me on this show. Absolutely. Great having you. And that's going to wrap it up for today. So thank you guys, and squanch you later. Wubba-wubba-dub-dub from Hollywood, California.